Hi there, my name is Pastor Dan Vance, and I'll be preaching today from 2 Timothy chapter 3 on the theme of essential for service. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, it's so humbling to stand before you knowing that all of us and every single person we come into contact with will eventually stand before you and give an account. We thank you, Lord, that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us the, the opportunity to respond in faith and to receive full forgiveness for all of our sins so that we might have confidence that when they, that day comes, we can say we're covered by the blood of Jesus God, I thank you for the way that has transformed my life, this faith in Christ. And I pray that you would help me and uh, everyone joining with me today to see how that same faith uh, transforms everything that we do, everything that we are, and help us to see, Lord, how that faith drives us to care about other people. God, I pray that as we see the concerns and issues and problems in other people's lives, we would realize that you call us to minister and that the tool you've given us is your word. Help us to understand what the sufficiency of scripture means, how we can be a blessing to others, and how uh, we can use your word to help them see the answers that are there. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In April of this year, a 64-year-old man in France was given the gift of a lifetime. His employees surprised him with a ride in a fighter jet, maximum speed 870 miles per hour. The plane took off and the fun began. CNN reports that as the plane was climbing, when it was about 2,500 feet above ground, the passenger panicked and he reached for something to hold on to. And the thing that he grabbed was the ejector seat button. Thankfully, he made it back to the ground safely. But I wonder if there in the sky, he was wishing that he had some things with him. Maybe he was wishing for a sweater. It's probably kind of cold up there. Maybe some motion sickness pills. Maybe he wished he had a friend there to hold his hand in this moment of terror. I don't know what he was thinking. But there was one thing that was essential. His parachute, as he soared toward the ground, that life-saving canvas opened up and he was safe. It was sufficient for his need. 2 Timothy 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us. In this verse, we find a wonderful, wonderful promise that God, who is infinite in power, gives us what we need, what is essential for life and and godliness. As a counselor, you will interact with people who probably feel like they've been ejected from a plane. The things they counted on, worked for, have been stripped away, and they're in free fall. How can we possibly help these people who are so burdened with anxiety, anger, infertility, poverty, abuse, exhaustion, addiction? Answer, we can find everything that they need in Scripture, just like the parachute that helped that man in France, we will see today that Scripture is essential and sufficient for properly addressing every problem. Do you believe that? Scripture is essential and it's sufficient for properly addressing every problem. It's kind of the obvious foundational idea in biblical counseling, but it's not without controversy. Can't people get help and solve their problems without the Bible and its religion? Is it really essential, like a parachute? Many people feel the Bible is more like a warm sweater that you put on to feel good, but you can get by without it. And what about sufficient? Don't a lot of people need professional help, not just some Bible verses? These are important questions. Let's find the answers in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Follow along in your own Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says this. 
But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jonas and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind, disapproved concerning the faith, but they will progress no further. For their folly will be manifest to all, as theirs also was. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have, been, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture was sufficient then. Look with me again in verse 1. We'll see that Scripture was sufficient back then. In verse 1 it says, In the last days perilous times will come. Just like Timothy, the young pastor to whom this was written, we are in the last days. People do just as the text describes. These kinds of selfish traits wreak havoc on homes, schools, communities, governments, and even churches. In fact, this list is specifically pointing toward people in the church where Timothy was. We start to realize in verse 5, they have a form of godliness but denying its power. And then verse 6 describes how these particular charlatans targeted women. Now these verses here might seem a little unusual to us. It's using some things that maybe aren't uh, how we would say things today. But just a quick note. It's not saying anything about women in general, I believe, about them all being gullible or weak or something like that. It just happened to be true in this particular context with these particular women, they were being led astray and these charlatans were targeting them. Timothy is warned in verse 5, stay away from these false teachers. Now obviously, this command is about people who are working to infect the church with their myths and self-love. That kind of junk must be avoided. Now, in other places in Scripture, we are reminded that we should reach out and minister to people who are unforgiving, who love pleasure, who are boastful or unholy. But those kinds of false teachers, stay away from them. What I want you to see in verses 1 through 9 is that times have not changed. People are still the same. In fact, in verse 13, Paul says that evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. What's the solution? Verse 14 tells us, press on in what you have learned and been taught from the Bible. That's the essential argument of the passage. Timothy is living in a messed up world just like we are. What does he need? Stay close to the scriptures. Scripture was essential then and it still is now. That's what we see in verses 1 through 9. Scripture was sufficient then, and it still is now. Move with me down to verse 15. 
This is the heart of the passage, the verse that most of us have memorized. And it tells us, why is Scripture sufficient? Well, first of all, second, Scripture is holy and supernatural. Verse 15, from childhood you have known the holy Scriptures. That's so familiar to us. It's literally printed on every one of our copies of God's Word, holy Bible. Don't miss that word. Holy means sacred, set apart. It means separated into a different class. Scripture is unique from every other kind of literature, every other help, every other intervention. And then verse 16 tells us why. Well, why is it different? Why is it unique? Because it's given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration means breathed out by God. Think about that. The all-knowing, all-powerful, matchless God from Him and through Him and to Him are all things He has sent out from His mouth. This book, Scripture always tells the truth. It has an incomparable power and it promises to work. Scripture is holy and supernatural. Familiar doctrines, to be sure. Let's not forget them. I want to draw you a little word picture to help us answer the question about how the Bible relates to all the other experts and books and medications and interventions that are out there to help suffering people. Imagine a five-star restaurant. You walk in and the workers are wearing fancy bow ties, black and white. It's a classy place. The ceiling is coated in gold and a massive chandelier is casting a dazzling sparkle over the entire room. You're seated at the table, maybe with your spouse. You open up the menus and you make a selection. While you're waiting on the food, you notice the beautiful fresh flowers that are at every table. When the chef is finished with his culinary creation, he sets it before you, and it looks extraordinary. Bright colors, swirled sauces, a little flowery thing on top. You're not sure if you're supposed to eat it or if it's decoration. And then you take that fork and you take a bite. Wow, it's bursting with flavor. Now, what did you need out of this experience? Food. That's essential. You won't live without it. But what about all the other things in the story? Do they matter? Are they valuable? Of course. Here's the point as it applies to people and their problems, including you and me. Psychologists and doctors, they can have incredible insights into the human con condition, whether they know the Lord or not. Medications, proper diet and exercise, those are powerful tools. Recovery meetings, a hug from a friend, self-help books, the internet, fresh air, whatever. All of these things can be tools that provide help. But Scripture claims to be in a class of its own. Its words are supernatural and directly from God. Remember, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus told the tempter, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. There's those same doctrines. The, the inspiration of Scripture, it comes from God. It's supernatural, which means it's essential. It's what we need more than anything else. It's like bread. This is what our counselees need. In our illustration, God's Word is the food the actual substance that will nourish and sustain you. It's what you need. It's what your counselees need. Scripture is essential, and it's also sufficient. It is enough to answer the most pressing problems and help you find security and truth, no matter what it is you're facing or what it is your counselees are facing. That's not to say that adding other helps on top of Scripture is wrong. Just make sure that they do not contradict Scripture, or else it'd be like adding a garnish of poisonous antifreeze to our metaphorical dinner. So, to recap, 
All other sources of help may be enjoyable, insightful, or enhance our experience, but without Scripture, you will not have all that you need. And the reason that is true is point number three. Scripture is essential and sufficient because Scripture brings salvation. Again, a simple truth, but we've always got to come back to this. Why is Scripture essential and sufficient? Because it brings salvation. Salvation from God's wrath. Salvation to a new life. Verse 15. The Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. That one word, salvation, it's loaded with importance and peppered throughout nearly every book of the Bible. Because Scripture reveals this to be our need. It's the key to every other issue. Imagine a person who gets in a terrible bike wreck. They had their helmet on, so they're okay uh, in the head. But the chain has cut their leg, and they are bleeding really fast. And a bystander comes along and says, Would you look at that? I found this in the wreckage. And he holds up a wedding ring. It got knocked off of your hand. Here it is. I found it. That is what happens when people find help and solutions without Jesus. Now, at first glance, that might seem harsh. Are we not happy when people stop beating their kids or get off of drugs or with or without the Bible? Are we not happy about that? Well, we would agree that those problems matter, like losing a wedding ring. It's a big deal. Everyone would want that back. But the Bible tells us that indeed we are like the man on the bike, bleeding out and in mortal danger from our sin. What we need is to be saved, along with the other important problems like money, manners, and marriages. As counselors, we've got to consistently point people to that salvation which comes through faith in Christ Jesus. Without that rescue, all other progress will be temporary and superficial. This salvation does not just guarantee life with Jesus in the hereafter. It gives promise for success in this life as well. Look at verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Number four, scripture is effective. Scripture is effective. Let's pull apart those significant words in verse 16. The word doctrine is telling us what is right, the truth. That next word, reproof, that's identifying what is not right. And then correction, how to get right. Instruction and righteousness That's how to stay right. Make sure you you get those down. Scripture is effective, as it tells us in verse 16. It tells us what is right. It identifies what is not right through reproof. It tells us how to get right. That's what correction means. And then instruction in righteousness. How can we stay right? Do you believe this verse? Do you believe that there is a problem in this world, financial, emotional, physical, spiritual, that's not covered here? There is not. Scripture has the resources to solve every problem. Verse 17 brings it all to a conclusion. It says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Number five, Scripture is all-encompassing. It is sufficient. I recognize that this material is basic, probably familiar to you, but sometimes revisiting that foundation can be helpful. I hope 2 Timothy will stir up these reminders in your memory as you confront hurting, needy people. Maybe you can even use some of these illustrations to help people see the connection between those those things that they try to do to, to help their problems and the Bible. It's not that Having other things in the hopper to help you out is necessarily wrong. But all of them are going to fall short without the guiding light of Scripture. That's the very bread 
You cannot live, you cannot thrive truly without Scripture. You've probably seen counselees that make progress or they're able to power through or go cold turkey or do this or that. And they say, you know what, I just, I just want to be better. And so, Bible counselor, can you just show me how the Bible can help me to get out of this entanglement or to just feel better about life? I know for me, it's kind of tempting sometimes to say, you know, wouldn't it be good if this person could just improve their character or if their marriage could just get, uh, hold on together, whether they come to Christ or not? Well, Scripture tells us that without Jesus, all of these things are, are going to pass away so soon. Let us not lose sight of this truth. That we need to set before people the eternal truths of the Word of God and show them that they really do need Scripture. It's essential and it's sufficient. I want to think through some points of application as we close. As you think about 2 Timothy 3, what, what's the importance here? What does this mean? First, letter A, as you increase your knowledge of God's word, you will increase in your ability to help other people. Take a class. Go to church every Sunday. But stay in the word every single day. Dig into God's word for yourself. Grow personally. And as you grow in your knowledge of scripture, you're going to unlock more and more and more uh, truth and readiness to help other people with their problems. Letter B, failure will be frequent because our goal is lofty. I just want to say that straight out. Uh, I, I don't have lots and lots of experience with counseling, but man, in the short time that I've been trying to use God, God's word to help people, you realize this really quick, that there's frequent failure. And the reason is because our goal is so high Think about it. Secular doctors and psychologists, they're tasked with keeping people alive and helping them cope. But biblical counselors are aiming for the complete conversion of the soul and that every converted sinner may be complete. That's a tall order, but it's one that Scripture is sufficient for. Finally, one last point of application. Counselees are tempted to forget about the supernatural nature of Scripture. Now, this applies specifically, specifically to believers. Unbelievers, their, their eyes are blinded, and for the most part, they are not going to see Scripture as supernatural. Maybe a good self-help book, but certainly not the inerrant Word of God. But for Christian counselees, even, even, uh, even they are tempted to sometimes forget about the supernatural nature of Scripture. As you counsel, watch for those subtle signs that your counselee is hoping in your wisdom, your brilliance, or maybe his own willpower for change. Pay attention when meditation on Scripture seems like an afterthought, you know, something to check off. You can, that can even happen in our own counseling practice, that we have all of these ideas, all of these tips and tricks, all of these questions that we want to ask, and uh, maybe we just kind of throw out at the beginning, hey, how's your time in the Word been, before we get on to the rest of it. Scripture is essential. Understanding of God's Word and applying its principles, that's everything in biblical counseling. So again and again, take them back to this basic fact. The Bible is the very breath of God. It is holy and sufficient. Let me close by praying for you. God, thank you for this conference. We realize, Lord, that there are a lot of challenges in this world, one of which is technology and navigating it wisely. As we think about all of the temptations and issues and all of the potential uh, helps and encouragements and tools that we might use, May we ground everything that we do and say in our uh, attempts to help other people in your word. God, I pray that you would truly use the wisdom that uh, you've given us from your inspired word, which you breathed out for our benefit so that we might be saved and so that we might have spiritual life. God, help us to wisely pass that on to others, to show them how they can have eternal life through your word and how also it's sufficient for every issue to make them perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. We ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ.
Amen. Thanks so much for studying this with me. May God bless you and keep you.